In this video, we're going to deploy a machine and see our VRA event subscription in action. Let's get started. Hi everyone, I'm Brian Watchers from Bavork. If this is your first time here and you want to learn about automating, programming, and monitoring in VMware environments, you're in the right place. Start now by subscribing and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing. Welcome back. The big moment has arrived. Uh, you'll recall in the previous videos, we have created at four different subscriptions. You can see them here again. Again, we have a subscription that's going to get called before a machine actually starts getting even built, after a machine is done being built, then uh, during the middle of a machine's life and time, as the users uh, perform day two operations like power on and power off, we'll see this subscription comes into play. And our last subscription is going to get kicked off when the machine gets destroyed at the end of its life. So again, these are the four subscriptions that we set up. If you don't recognize these because you haven't seen the previous videos, make certain that you go look at the, the info card because there's a playlist for all of the videos. All right, so what we're going to be doing in this particular video in the lab is we are going to go to VRA, we're going to go into the catalog and we're going to request a deployment from a blueprint. So let's head over there and do that. As you can see, I'm logged into VRA's Automation Cloud Assembly here in the lab. And what I'm going to do next is go over to the blueprint section to show you the blueprint that we're going to, to deploy from. Now I've got um, a half a dozen or so different blueprints here. The way we've defined our subscription, the subscription will trigger for any deployment from any of these blueprints. But we're going to focus on this specific blueprint here simply because it shows a few things that I want you to see in our actual example. So here we are looking at a blueprint for a very simple blueprint. All this blueprint does is deploy a single machine. Let me select that machine and you'll notice when I select the machine over on the right, the YAML code highlights the portion of the YAML code that defines how we're going to deploy that machine. There's a couple things I want you to see in this YAML code. The first thing I want you to see is this property defined here called image. And there's another similar property called flavor. The, those two properties are defined by vRealize Automation. In, I should say those are passed in by VRI's automation into our orchestrated workflow automatically. On the other hand, the bottom two lines here show you me creating my own properties or what you might call custom properties. So I've defined a custom property here called user defined variable string because it holds a string. That one's holding the string ALPHA. And another variable called user defined variable number, which is holding a numeric value. I can pass in different types of information from my VRA blueprint into the VRA workflow simply by defining these custom properties in the property section of my machine in my YAML code in my blueprint. So uh, if you've never encountered the, the notions of image and flavor, those have to do with something in VRA called image mapping and flavor mapping, uh, neither which is strictly related to subscriptions, but since I'm mentioning them, I may as well tell you what they are. The basic idea behind flavor mappings is flavor mappings allow us to do, um, do to have predefined sizes in terms of CPU memory and so forth for the machines that we deploy. Some people call this t-shirt sizing. So when we see here flavor colon small, that means somewhere elsewhere in VRealize Automation, we've defined how big a small machine is as opposed to medium and large. No, you're not limited to those three names. You can have small, medium, large, extra large, extra small, super monstrously large. You can have whatever you want, but we'll just use small, medium, large as our example. So flavor mappings are for t-shirt sizing and image mapping is uh, essentially used to define what and how to install an operating system and applications and so forth into the machine that we're deploying. So again, image mapping and flavor mapping is not uh, specifically related to, to subscriptions, but 
the image property and the flavor property along with my two custom properties are all going to get passed into my VR workflow. Uh, by the way, if you are uh, familiar with passing in information via the payload in VRI's Automation 7 and know how it was done there, it is so much easier to do the same thing here in VRI's Automation 8. If I want to pass in user defined variable string, I just put an entry in the blueprint that says user defined variable string. All right, so now that you've seen the blueprint, let's actually go deploy from the blueprint. We can do it just by clicking on the deploy button down here below. So when you deploy from a blueprint, the first thing you're going to be asked to do is to give a name for your deploy deployment. I'm going to call this one subscription test number one. And you need to pick a version of the blueprint. Currently, there's only one version of the blueprint, the current version. So I'll select that. And then if I wanted to, I could type a a description. So this is my description. Now, the description that we type here is not going to affect how the blueprint behaves. It's just a piece of data that we're going to store. So I've named my deployment. I said which version of the blueprint I want to use. I'm going to uh, type a description if I want to. But the key thing to do next is to click Deploy. And as you can see, my blueprint is now being used to deploy the contents of the, the blueprint. You'll recall the blueprint said to deploy a single machine. Uh, by the way, on this topology tab, we're going to see that machine show up here shortly. But if you want a more detailed view of what's going on, if you go to the history tab, you can see information in here that tells you step by step what's going on in the, the um, deployment of this blueprint. And if you look at the timestamps here, you'll notice that down on the bottom, we have the, um, the step that occurred first. And then as we move up the list, we're seeing the more and more recent steps that are being performed. Now, if I want to refresh the screen at any point in time, instead of waiting for the refresh, I can click the refresh button. And I can just sit here watching for a while. But rather than continue to stare at the screen, remember the point of this video is to show you an event triggering and in response to the subscription we set up for that event to see an orchestrator workflow being kicked off. So let's actually go over to the orchestrator client. We interrupt this video for a brief message. There's tons more information than I can share just in these videos alone. So see the YouTube description down below where you can find a link where you can find more information about how to join me in the classroom. We're returning to our previously scheduled programming. And I'm going to go to, earlier we were in workflows, but now I'm going to go to workflow runs. Workflows is where the definitions of the workflows reside. But every time a workflow runs, you get something called a workflow token, or some people call them workflow runs. If we click on workflow runs, you can see here that my workflow called log VRA event payload has been called twice. Brian's about to get confused. Can you figure out why there are two workflow tokens? Let us know in the YouTube comments below. Once in response to compute.provision.pre and another time in response to compute.provision.post. If I had come here sooner, you would have actually seen just the first um, workflow run for the pre-stage of building the machine. But in either case, these are both instances where the workflow has run. And we can see here that the workflow completed successfully, and we can see when it started running and so forth. But to see more detailed information about each of these workflow runs, you just simply click on the name of the workflow run. So notice I'm clicking um, the first workflow run. This is the workflow run that occurred when the machine entered the pre-provision state. So let's click that one. And when you examine this workflow run, there's a whole bunch of information here spread across different tabs, including there's a tab here labeled general, which has general information. But I'm more interested in this variables tab. So let's go there. In the variables tab, you'll notice that there are a whole bunch of variables called underscore underscore metadata something. 
including, let me scroll down and find it. Actually, I don't even have to scroll down. You'll recall in the previous video, I showed you an example metadata variable called underscore underscore metadata underscore event dot topic ID. All of these different pieces of metadata, which contain useful information for your workflow, can be retrieved by using that code I showed you in the previous video. In addition to all the metadata, there's one other variable that gets passed in automatically called input properties. Now you'll recall input properties is the name of the input that we needed to define for our orchestrator workflow. And I told you that input properties is the variable through which VRA sends the payload of info into the orchestrator workflow. So let's go see what's in input properties by expanding here and maybe scroll down a bit because there's a bunch of stuff in here. Inside of input properties, we have a ton of information, including um, standard things that it tells you that you don't have to do anything to get this information. For instance, here's the blueprint ID of the blueprint that's involved in this deployment, plus a bunch of other pieces of information that you get by default. But in addition, there's this entry here called custom properties. And when you look at custom properties, that's where you can find the flavor mapping information I told you about before and the image mapping. And additionally, notice that we can see the two different user defined variables that we set up. Again, those are the information that we got. Let's open up the orchestrator workflow again. Those are the pieces of information that we were able to get access to in our code. In our code, we saw in the previous video, I believe it was, this line of code is a sample for getting the metadata pieces of data that get sent to your orchestrator workflow. And then the following lines of code from here onwards, there we go, are useful for getting both the VMware defined pieces of information and your user defined pieces of information. And then all the rest of this workflow really does is, is log the results. So system.log the image, system.log the flavor, system.log this and that and the other. If we go back to that token again, let me close out of here. We'll go back for the through the token, also known as a workflow run. Oh, notice there's a third one now. We'll have to examine that one to see what that one's about. If we go look, we can see here that the logs tab indeed logs all that information I just showed you the code was logging. All right, so let's go back to workflow runs again. And uh, you'll recall this workflow run was for the pre-provision. This one I said is for post-provision. And um, let's actually examine it to see what it's got. So let's look at the post-provision workflow run. And I know it's the post-provision workflow run because if I go to the variables tab, it says compute provision pre. Hmm. Interesting. Apparently somebody, while I've been working on doing this recording, somebody has been logged into the system and is deploying their own machines. I didn't intend for you to see two compute dot provision dot pre's, but this does go to illustrate unintentionally illustrate the fact that my subscriptions are set up to respond to anybody who's doing any deployments in my environment. So in this particular case here, it's going to be uh, real important for us to pay close attention to the, the blueprint ID, which is another piece of metadata that gets passed in. But let's go back to the orchestrator client one more time and look at our workflow runs. And uh, this here is the, the post deployment provisioning workflow run. Let's look at it and to prove that it is indeed the right one this time, notice this one says post. So here we can see as a result of our deployment, we first saw the workflow run for the pre-provision state. Now we see the exact same type of information for the post state. And as a result, we're now able to do anything we want within the orchestrator workflows that we need to. So it's the, the workflows are not just going to do logging. They can do whatever we need them to do, integrate with whatever external system that we might need. Join me in the next video where we'll trigger a VRA subscription with a day two operation.